Today on Engine Power, we continue the build of our race-ready, corner-carving, barely legal Mustang with high-grip suspension and 13-inch Cobra brakes. Thanks for joining us on the second round of our shabby Mustang transformation. The 2.3 liter is gone, along with the 7.5 inch rear end, all the suspension, and 22 years of crud that was blasted away. Its new power plant, this Ford Racing Illuminator, roared out 451 horsepower straight out of the crate. Today, what's left of this 92 coupe is ready to become a barely legal street and race corner carver. So our focus is on this high performance suspension system from Maximum Motorsports, strong enough to contain the power of the Illuminator. Our kit came with Jack and Luca, who helped design and market this heavy duty G-Force Tamer. And while they test fit their full length subframe connectors, I'm taking advantage of the extra help by getting the rear axle put together so it's ready when they need it. A set of heat treated 410 Richmond gears are being installed. The pinion gear is already in and I'm checking the bearing preload. Now the ring gear will attach to the Auburn Gear Pro Series limited slip diff. Making certain the holes are aligned, I'll start fasteners with some red Loctite from the install kit. Using a soft dead blow, seat the ring gear to the differential and torque the bolts. This diff has a cone clutch design for lightning fast power transfer and we ordered it for 31 spline axles. The subframe connectors are a solid piece of square tubing with tabs to connect it to the subframe rails and a bracket that utilizes the seat mount fasteners to stiffen up the entire floor pan area. It flexes a lot when you're driving the car, it makes it very uncomfortable because the seat's moving around in different directions. So we make the subframe connectors so they mount to this area of the floor pan that's unsupported and it keeps the floor pan from tearing. To shape the tubing during manufacturing, a small indention was needed. Now Luca will weld in a plate to reinforce the area the bend was in. These connectors not only strengthen the chassis, they can be used as jacking rails as well. Maximum's K-member is next. It looks beefy because it is. Lots of gusseting and reinforcement to handle extreme conditions. It's not the lightest on the market, but it is the strongest. It will allow us to remove about 40 pounds off the front of the car. It's only being installed temporarily. The reason? To align it with the rest of the car. That will require having a point of reference at the rear of the car as well. So the lower control arms will be put up and a bolt through them for the next step. Using some fishing line and plumb bobs, four to be exact, we'll hang one on each side of the K-member just below where the control arms mount up. Then two more off the rear lower control arm bolts. We're lowering the car to get the plumb bobs close to the ground. Now place a small piece of tape under the bob and mark it with the point. Now we can place an X over the hole for a good visual. Same goes for both sides on the rear. 211. Now base measurements are taken front to back okay. to check the wheelbase and diagonally That's astoundingly close. I told you I'm good. To see how far out of alignment the K-member is. The diagonal measurements are very close to each other. The wheelbase on the left side is about four millimeters longer than the right. So we're going to take the right side of the K-member and shove it forward and then remeasure. Most people don't do this. We tell people they should because it has a significant effect on the handling and whether the car drives down the road straight and other effects. 2110? Yep. Wow. Remember we said it was only going in temporarily? Well, here's a tip so you don't have to go through the measuring process again. Using an eighth inch drill bit, drill one hole on each side of it. These will work as guide holes when we reinstall it. Maximum's forward offset control arms are next. These will move the front tires forward an inch and a half for advanced geometry. On a stock K-member, three quarters can be achieved. After we torque the pivot bolts, we want to make sure that the control arm pivots freely and that it will fall under its own weight. And it does. After all that, the K-member can be removed because the engine is going in from the bottom. We'll be right back. Some things are worth fighting for, and planting the illuminator is definitely one of them. We are back, and that's where our attention is headed. VHT's Ford Gray will protect the bottom. 
Plus, it will allow us to see any leaks and where they came from. The Panhard Bar axle mount can be attached to the driver's side lower control arm mount. It attaches using two fasteners and also houses the shock. The passenger side uses a mount for the coilover to rest in. Maximum's torque arm keeps the rear end from rotating when power is applied since the upper control arms will not be used. This is the heavy duty version that attaches to the axle tubes with U-bolts and requires a new hole to be drilled in the passenger side of the axle housing pad which is stronger and will not flex. The original hole for the mass damper on the driver's side needs to be enlarged to 9 16 of an inch for the larger hardware. The U-bolts get torqued to 33 foot-pounds in a cross pattern. The front bolts are torqued to 100 foot-pounds. First up, back here are the rear coilovers that use a custom 200-pound 10-inch spring spec by maximum. They're barrel-shaped to avoid rubbing on the adjuster sleeves during compression and wrapped around Coney adjustable shocks. All Fox bodies equipped with single exhaust, whether it was a four-cylinder or V8 car, has the hard to soft brake line transition here against the frame rail. Now this is where the muffler goes on a dual exhaust car, so we need to move that. Now we got this bracket from MPS Auto Salvage down in Georgia that'll locate it here, just like the original dual exhaust car. Now we're finally ready for the rear end. We'll slide the whole assembly under the car. Lowering it will allow us to attach the coilovers to the axle housing. Uh, down, Mike, a little more, par for it, right there. Doing this now will support the rear for the next step, which is attaching the lower control arms. A little wiggle this way Left. and a little that way right. will let the bolt find its new home. The passenger side goes in the same way. The barrel-shaped patented front torque arm bushing allows the torque arm to plunge forward and back as needed and also move angularly, preventing binding of the rear suspension. It rests inside its own cross member that will get attached to the subframe connectors in a little bit. Now that we have enough weight in the rear of the car, we can install the engine up front. Factory rubber mounts will join the illuminator to the K-member. Now here's a little advice. Make sure to keep all the hardware from your factory K-member like these nuts. The important ones are reused and have a stronger grade than what you can find at the hardware store. American Powertrain sent us this Magnum 6-speed. It's the bulletproof answer to transfer the power from the illuminator to the rear wheels. It's only going in for fitment now. Coming. Trying to keep the fork squared up with the center of the tunnel. Keep us as close as possible. All right, pretty close there, isn't it? Looks good. Now we'll lower the car until it's close to the engine. Right now we can't bring the engine straight up because it'll interfere with the sway bar bracket on this side and the other side. Here we go, Luke, your hands clear. Yeah, just go slow. So using a strap, slightly raise the driver's side of the engine All right, hold up. to tilt the entire assembly. Can you shift it towards me as far as it'll go? You good? Yep. All right. Slowly lower the car, making sure nothing I'm touches. Down. All we have to Over clear there. are the sway bar brackets. Once we get by them, ha, we're clear. It worked. We can hook to the lift chain and raise the engine right into place. This side looks great, plenty of room everywhere. Start the eight bolts that hold the K-member and put our tip from earlier to good use. Using the eighth inch drill bits, we will use them as guides to align the K-member back up with the chassis and tighten it for the final time. It's in, get it up, get the transmission cross member in and roll on. The Magnum six speed is longer than any production one offered in a Fox. So a modified cross member is needed. This came from American Powertrain and is called the X-Factor. It's made of aluminum for weight savings and features a modular design. It's made for 83 through 93 Mustangs using a Magnum Trans. We've come a long way, but we're not done yet. Stay with us. Going fast is only fun if you can slow it down. 13-inch Cobra brakes are next. So far today, we loaded the underside with some beefy suspension, then wiggled the illuminator into place. Time for some stopping power. This is our front brake kit, and this is our rear brake kit. When you hear the words big brake kit, you also see lots of dollar signs, but not anymore. Richard Oben from North Race Cars has a solution. Mike, this is where it all started. We had to develop a bracket that kept the Fox track for another application. This led to providing brakes for the rear, axles, cables, soft lines, which then led to a front brake kit. 
and all of it fits on a Fox Mustang. And all of it for less than 1300 bucks. The installation starts with this bracket. You can paint any color you want. The most important thing about the bracket is the offset. It brings the caliper inboard three quarters of an inch compared to the regular disc brake rear end and allows you to run a much wider wheel and tire without any rubbing issues on the fender. Using the supplied hardware, the bracket gets bolted to the rear flange and tightened evenly. Next are the 31 spline axles that came with the rear brake kit. We'll secure them with C-clips and pull the axles outward to hold them in place. Now install the cross pin in the differential, which will keep the axles from moving in and the C-clip from falling out. What makes this kit work so well on a Fox body is they were designed for a much heavier 94 through 98 body style. Now the weight difference simply equals a shorter stopping distance. And all topped off with the rear single piston caliper. We basically take a 94 to 98 Cobra brakes and make it fit perfectly on your Fox Mustang. The front brakes have to wait. I can't. We're not ready yet. Maximum steering shaft is telescoping, which means it will collapse in the event of a violent front end collision, making sure the steering wheel doesn't go into your chest. It also eliminates the rag joint, which gives you more header clearance. The rack is from Flaming River. It's a 15 to 1 quick ratio manual unit that is 3.3 turns lock to lock. Maximum Motorsports adjustable bushings allow clearance for your choice of oil pans and additional settings for bump steer. 96 through 04 V6 and V8 Mustang spindles are recommended to use with this K member. We store stars from MPS Auto Salvage in Statham, Georgia, who specialize in new and used parts for 87 through 2014 Mustangs. The factory camber plate can be scrapped for Maximum's adjustable caster camber plates. They give increased bump travel, greater range of camber adjustment, allow caster to be adjusted for a more stabilized alignment. Tony double adjustable shocks are wrapped in Maximum's coilover kit that uses two and a half inch hypercoil springs. The front brakes, just like the rear, are stock Cobra replacements. Maximum's bolt style bump steer kit uses a 5 8 bolt and a high strength large diameter spacer that is super stiff to give you very precise steering. With the rear coilovers out of the way, the Panhard chassis bracket can be installed. It attaches to the subframe rails and requires four holes to be drilled. Frame inserts will keep the frame from collapsing when it's tightened. The aluminum pan hard rod keeps the rear end centered in the vehicle, since the upper control arms are not in use. The torque arm cross member uses four bolts and six tabs to secure it to the frame rail. With the pinion angles checked, the tabs get welded in. The gross pinion angle is set at the height that this cross member is installed. Now if the pinion angle needs to be changed up or down, these shims up here will allow you to do it. The next alignment requires the rear tires on. American Muscle sent us one of their classy wheel and tire packages. Now this is their 0304 Cobra wheel in a 17 by 9 five lug configuration with the correct back spacing for a Fox body. Now they're wrapped in Nitto NT01 competition radials that are DOT approved. Now this thing is guaranteed to give you maximum traction on the track and these things came to us mounted, balanced with all the lug nuts. Yeah, it needs to come over this way quite a bit. Centering the rear end is simple. Using a long ruler, tape measure, and plumb bobs, so you can start turning, Mike. we can rotate the pan hard rod to move the whole rear axle. To the driver's side, four millimeters. Good. Okay. After recentering the cross member, they're down to one last part. Sway bar. It will help reduce uh, understeer in the handling of the vehicle and allow us to tune the handling balance by adjusting the uh, sway bar end links into the various holes on the sway bar arms. All that's left is a little tuning coming up. Well, I have to admit, this rear end is as beautiful as it is strong and designed for some serious tuning, but that can only happen with seat time. Now the front is artwork as well, but there are a few preliminary setups you need to do before you roll it out, like the caster camber and by all means, the toe. Luca is using a bubble type caster camber gauge to start the alignment process. Now we're looking for a reading of just under negative two degrees for the camber setting. All right, so we're at seven eighths degree negative camber. So an adjustment is needed. 
Raising the car will take the weight off the suspension, allowing the caster camber plate to be adjusted. Now we can rest the car back on the ground and take another reading. Two and three eighths negative camber. That's good for aggressive street and track events. And the other side? All right, we're at negative two and a half degrees, so that's close enough. Now that both sides are equal and the caster is set as well, we can set the toe. It's simply measuring both tires to assure they are parallel with each other. 67 and three quarters rear, 70 and a quarter front, three eighths towed out. If not, turning the inner tie rod allows movements in either direction. Toe is zero, perfect. When we developed this kit on my 87 Mustang, we wanted something that would make the driver really feel connected to the road and the car, where your thoughts get translated directly into actions from the vehicle. And we think we really achieved something with this product. The bad part is you can't see the bottom all the time. You'll need mirrors for that. And you can add that to your list. Kinsler Fuel Injection specializes in mechanical and electronic fuel injection for race or high performance street cars, whether they're domestic or an import. Now this is one of their custom built K-Series Honda intake manifolds that features a 12 degree intake angle, magnesium intake runners, and check this out. The bolts holding the throttle body are evenly spaced so indexing is very simple. Now if you plan on making big power with the Honda K-Series, Kinsler can make the intake manifold you need. Now, not all fuel pressure relief valves are created equal. Kinsler's K140 valve was designed for a competition racing, making it the lightest, highest flowing valve with the least amount of pressure rise. It uses multiple springs that travel inside a carrier for smoothness. Now the valve with this combination of springs is adjustable from 72 to 152 PSI. If you need a different range, different spring combinations are available. Thanks to a very special proprietary diaphragm material, this valve is 100% compatible with E85, methanol, ethanol, and race gas. The lightweight aluminum components are hard coat anodized, which makes them impervious to those fuels. Kinsler supplies these valves to NASCAR Sprint Cup cars, Indy cars, and the Daytona Corvette prototype cars. So basically, now you can have the most precise fuel control valve available and pick one up at Kinsler.com. Optima Battery's yellow top is a true dual purpose battery, meaning it'll work in cars, trucks, tractors, even forklifts. Now this thing will come back from deep power drains to full recharge time and time again. Now low internal resistance provides more consistent power output and faster recharges. Now vehicles with lots of accessories is exactly what this yellow top wants to feed. So if you're looking for faster startups and a better performing vehicle, pick one up at your local AutoZone. If your power adder of choice is shoved into a bottle, this should spike your interest. It's NOS's carbon fiber bottle that's equipped with a high flow valve and a built-in siphon tube. Now if your bottle is overfilled or if it exceeds the maximum pressure safety rating, the blow off valve venting system will release the nitrous into a safe area. Now this bottle only weighs in at 8 pounds 12 ounces compared to a standard bottle's 14 pounds 12 ounces. Now that weight savings will allow you to carry a little extra nitrous or put the weight in the area of the car you need it most to meet your weight requirement. Now if you're looking for one of these bottles, check out Summit Racing and you can pick one up for just under 590 bucks. That's it for engine power. We'll see you next time.